Hello, I am Rachel McLean, Community Relations Liaison with The Mather, a forward-thinking life plan community being developed in Tysons for those 62 and better. Our community is projected to open in 2023 and we are currently taking reservations. At The Mather, we recognize that art infuses our lives with vibrancy and meaning and we are so honored to be able to support the McLean Project for the Arts Meet the Artist series. Enjoy the conversation. Hello and welcome. I'm Lori Carboneau, Executive Director of McLean Project for the Arts, and I welcome you today to the Emerson Gallery, where we're showing the work of the Washington Sculptors Group in our Sculpture Now exhibition. Come back on Tuesday night, that's tomorrow, when you have a chance to see our curator, Nancy Saucer, walk you through this exquisite exhibition. We know you love it. So MPA Art Fest 2020 is teaching us a lot. It's virtual MPA Art Fest, as you know, and we have come to learn that virtual does not mean not real. It's a treat to have this time with these artists today, and we thank heartily the Mather, the forward-thinking retirement community in Tysons, who has supported us as we have put together this first week of Artist Talks. Thank you so much to the Mather. We very appreciate your community support and your commitment to making art vibrant for all of our citizens. Today, it's a treasure to welcome Cynthia Miller, our board member and an artist on her own, as she interviews three of our MPA Art Fest artists. They're Barbara Janiskevich, Jennifer Moffitt, and Elise Harrison. So if this is your first artist talk, or you've been to them all week, we thank you, we welcome you, we welcome you back, and encourage you to enjoy all that is MPA Art Fest. Hello, and welcome to MPA Art Fest, Art Fest Talks. I'm Cynthia Miller, and I'm an Act 5 artist, and on the Education Committee of MPA. Act 5 just means that I've had a number of professions, and now I am an artist. To those of you who are new to MPA Art Fest, this is our 14th year, and the first year we are doing this virtually. MPA brings art and community together, offering events, music, artwork, and so much more. This year, we are thrilled to bring 52 exhibiting artists. I encourage you, if you haven't already looked at our artists' websites, please go to the artist studios in our artist section of the website to browse all of their works. I'm going to be introducing three artists today, Barbara Jenishevitz, Jennifer Moffat, and Elise Harrison. And now I so warmly welcome and am so thrilled to be interviewing Barbara Janiszewicz. Barbara, in looking back over time, you have such a formative history of developing. Would you just give us one or two really important stages and how those stages were, were invaluable in your experiences today? Thank you, Cynthia. That's a really good question. Um, first of all, I want to thank um, McLean Project of the Arts for hosting this wonderful art fest. It's really important that we support the arts in our community. And I've been part of this in Washington, DC. Um, by the way, my name is Barbara Jettiskevich, and I know it's really long and scary. Everyone in my family says it different. Jewiskowitz, Giannis Kevich, but I sort of like Janice Kevich because I can pronounce it. But uh, my history basically was uh, I was educated in uh, Jacksonville University as an art major and uh, joined the airlines and flew around the world to see every museum I possibly could and to discover all the artists that I really read in textbooks. 
And then after the airlines, I started painting. And I would say my pro process has been learning from the masters and understanding the elements of art and the principles of art. And I can paint and draw literally upside down and backwards very tight. My image, um, I take in images a lot better than I can take in language skills. And that's, you know, characteristics of a visual artist. And a turning point, you asked about turning point, is I got actually bored of painting things. Um, and I didn't understand representative um, art versus abstract art, because I had always painted things. And I realized that abstract art is actually harder because you're getting rid of the content and you're really getting into the elements of art. And in my case, it was really understanding that it was the flashes and these moments of seeing the transparency of color while on painting, working on a composition that leads you in. And my clients now, it, it's very interesting because a lot of them think I can't paint an apple or something realistic like a phone and it's arbitrary that it's just thrown down on the canvas. And yet, if you understand the history of art, this is really coming out of mid-century um, art, looking at a lot of the work from Helen Frankenthaler and Morris Lewis and understanding the techniques. And I had been a watercolor artist for years. and learning how to stain paper and versus going over to canvas was a big leap. And one of my favorite people on earth is Robin Rose, and he's a Washington DC artist. And he told me years ago, I needed to go bigger and I needed to go on canvas. And I refused to push myself to keep learning because I was in a safe space. I was selling my art, I was happy, until one day I woke up and I was bored what I was painting. And to learn how to sort of change your style and dive into it and understanding the complexity of abstract art was a life changing. So today, when you walk into your studio, what practices do you favor? Okay, um, what practices do I favor? Yeah, well, how often do you experiment? Or are you always experimenting? No. No, I'm not. I'm not experimenting. Um, I have a direction. I have uh, a set rules of applying my work and applying and going to the canvas. I, I have to make up all my, all my colors uh, ahead of time. I have to work on the uh, color theory, like um, not every blue can go over a yellow. Um, not every yellow can go over a blue. So it's, it's almost mathematics. It's like a chess game. Um, a lot of artists, mm -hmm. they say it's a process, and mm -hmm. they're just like throwing it, and that's okay. That's sort of chaotic. Mine has order, and I've been told it, I, when people look at it, it's almost like an intellectual thought because you can contemplate and you can imagine what you want, but the complexity of the paintings hold together with the same elements of my classical training. So how does music, and I know that's really big for you and where you've come from and where you've been, how is music helping? Is that, are you doing that today? Or is that, how does that feature into to your processes? Okay, very good question. Um, I have a lot of um, jazz masters who I work with, and they're very, very good friends. And um, they're all inspire me to be a better artist. So I'm always listening to music while I'm painting. But lately, I really see that the ideas of my work sort of hold together because of, like, I'll, I'll share something with you. Like, um, some of the paintings that I do, it's really about like the layerings of color. And for instance, let's look at this one right Ooh. Share. Okay, so like this one here, um, more so now than ever, that you can see that I have darks over lights and you don't do that in watercolors, you, you can't. But you see the luminosity of the light shining through. And I feel that once I put my paintbrush down, 
anyone can look at my artwork and relate to it. And I'm not telling you what to think. But more so today, it's about unity and harmony and expressions of different colors, like the diversity of mankind. So I'm actually looking at my art as a reflection of humanity, all of us being different shades of color, coming together and forming a beautiful rainbow. Mm -hmm. And um, almost all of my work, when you look at it, is a uniform of other colors coming together. Absolutely. And the greens are on top of the reds, and, you know, they make their own grays. And because of that, uh, you see patterns and you see relationships that might not be obvious at the first viewing but it, it's sort of like as you explore my work you sort of see how it relates to you how you identify with it and that's what I really like about um, my process like here's a simple one it's one two three four five six brush strokes that's all it is. But my brushes are made out of brooms and mops, and this painting is 22 by 30. And so you still see my brush strokes, you see my control, you see how I'm planning, and, and sort of like having it grow out. And here's a big one that was done on canvas, and it fills around. Mm -hmm. And this one's still mm -hmm. for sale, this one's in my studio. And, and this one, it's very interesting because you can see in my work that I actually do it so you can sort of move it around. It's not sort of set in one direction. Most of the time, there's a couple different ways of um, showing the work. Does that answer the question? Yeah, that, that's fabulous. And we, we find out so much when we, when we listen to you and talk about that. Are there any untried themes or processes you've been thinking about moving into that you would share with us? Okay, well, oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I see that because I had a breakthrough about um, uh, six years ago, uh, I absolutely changed my style. I thought I was at the point of being the best artist I could be, and all of a sudden, I met Paul Reed, who was the last Washington College School artist, and he pushed me to be a better artist. And I realize now that I have to keep pushing myself and keep growing. And one of the things about growing is that sometimes you have to put yourself in uncomfortable situations. And for instance, I'll show you mm. my, my studio. <laughs> so this is my studio and it, it's huge. I divide it in like little corners. All right, wow. Uh, so this is one corner of my studio and um, I have like a little seating area. You see all those orange chairs. Sometimes I, I'm working with young um, students and helping them. But that's like a, my sort of like research area. This is a wide angle view of about one third of my studio. I have a lot of space. And then um, here is like another little corner. And so my process is I work on different things. You see there's some on the floor, but most of the time I have my artwork up on walls and, and I pin it to the wall so I can actually, like you see the one in the back. Yeah. And yeah. then I contemplate, does it need another brush stroke? Um, is this, am I happy with it? And uh, the problem is, if I don't tag it and name it, um, uh, if it's in my studio, I might still keep painting on it. And yeah. so I took a picture of a painting and sent it to a client not too long ago. And then the client wanted it. I couldn't find it in my studio because I kept painting on it. I didn't even recognize the painting. <laughs> Funny. So I, I got to be careful with that. So the process is, I will never say... I'm not going to be exploring other um, ideas. Um, I'm looking at plexiglass now. I did a huge mural uh, just two years ago here in Arlington, and I painted on metal. Mm -hmm. I love going really big. And you have a really good talent for that, I believe. Yeah. So out there, please, world, give me opportunities to go really big. I would love to paint uh, a work with a stage production, um, do a background. Ever since I saw Madam Butterfly at the Kennedy Center, I've wanted to even do bigger environments. Mm -hmm. um, so the bigger the wall, the, the bigger the space, I'm happier. 
So what would you advise artists venturing out as professionals today? What, like one or two points. To be very, very disciplined and narrow. Be very good at what you do and have your own voice. Don't copy somebody else just because you think they're selling. Um, it's almost a disrespect to, for yourself and for the craft. A knowledge who your teachers were. Um, I'm always talking about Mon Kwan, who taught me how to paint. Even though I was only studied under him for three years, it's been 40 years I keep giving him credit. And the artists that I look at which are Morris Lewis and Kenneth Nolan, I acknowledge them, but I go beyond them. So I would say, find your own voice. Um, don't go out there until you're ready. Um, art is about something you have to do, not to do it for money. And one of the last thoughts I'd like to leave you with is, it's really important that not everyone's an artist. We need people to understand the importance of having art in their home, to live with art and support the uh, artistic community. Um, I was giving a talk in my community where 600 people showed up, uh, had a small gallery, and it was closing. And they, the um, community asked me why it was closing. And I asked everyone in the room, do you love art? And everyone raised their hand. And I was like, so happy. And then I said, um, so how many people have art in their homes? Everyone raised their hand. And then the next question I asked is, tell me the name of the artist in your community that you own. Not one person could raise their hand and tell me about an artist mm. that they had in their community. And if we don't have um, people supporting the creative community and understanding the importance of living with really good art, there's not going to be a creative community. We need to have commerce. My advice to uh, up and coming artists is not as important as my advice to the community. Artists will find their own voice and they'll see what's successful and they paint because they have to, not to make money. But it is a livelihood. And if we don't have um, the community buying our art and just going to Crate and Barrel and buying a poster and spending $4,000, you could buy you know, one of my paintings for $250. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara, you know, you, you have, uh, you even answered my, lat my open question, which was, what haven't I asked you about that you'd like to tell us about? And you've, you've given us so much valuable information about who you are as an artist, your passion for the community, your passion for other artists. I, I truly think we are so blessed to have you as an instructor at MPA, as well as being part of the 14th Art Fest. And with that, I thank you and look forward to seeing you. Thank you, Cynthia. Keep You're up welcome. the good work. I will. And peace, everybody. And let's be kind to each other. Thank yes. you. Absolutely. Take care. Bye. Hello, Jennifer Moffitt. Hello. I'm Cynthia Miller, and I'm so happy to meet you and interview you for our McLean Art Fest. So let me start with a, kind of a broad question because I know your background so I'm really and it's so just wild and crazy and that you've you've got left arm left left side and right side of your brain coming together for this beautiful art. Looking back over time describe of your few of your most formative learning experiences how they've brought you to where you are today as an artist? Well, I grew up in a very artistic community uh, in Clarksburg, Maryland. My mother was a piano and voice teacher and I was surrounded by uh, this little enclave of artists. Um, we had a woman who did wood cutting and watercolors and acrylics and uh, I just feel as though my community was very artistic. And from elementary school on, I was drawing, um, I experimented with um, uh, all kinds of, in high school, all of my elective classes were art. Um, I took um, videography in college. My, my honors degree for my senior project in college, instead of being a paper, I was given permission to do a, a video 
uh, which is the first time that had ever been done. Um, and so I've tried, and then in my professional life, I started out in, in, as in a photography assistant. So I've tried a number of different uh, artistic medium. And, um, and then I got into my career and you sort of follow your strengths. Um, and I followed my strength of uh, management of, of creative departments. Uh, but I missed making my own art. So uh, I was on vacation um, in 2009 with my husband's family and there was a, a bead shop nearby. And I, I'd heard so much about beading. It just seemed to be the latest craze. And I was like, how hard could that be? So um, I hadn't been able to find a pink necklace to my liking. And I'm like, well, let me, let me just check out the shop. And I went into that store and looked around and I feel as though I had been plugged in after being unplugged for years. I felt oh. an electricity going through me. Whoa. And it, it really, it just woke up, woke me up to the fact that I needed to explore my own creativity um, rather than shuffling everyone else's around. Uh, and so I started doing that in the background, taking classes and creating things. And I did beading for several years until I got, uh, my husband gave me a glass fusing class for Christmas one year. And I took it and that was I was it. hooked. I was just hooked. Uh -huh. So when, you, when you're doing your work, are there themes or, or the excitement comes from the color or where does that, where are the driving forces for, for your beautiful, beautiful necklaces and earrings and, and things? I, well, I it's a curiosity of what happens when I try this. Um, and the other part really is from the materials. I work with uh, materials in almost every single piece that have metallic coatings on them. Um, what I'm wearing right now has two different metallic coatings. It's dichroic and iridescent. Um, and sometimes I'll work with double dichro or, you know, um, combinations of different things to get different um, results and, and just to see what happens when I do this. Um, but dichro is just, it's so cool. And, um, I think it has a really bad rap from the 1970s uh, where, you know, it just was done a lot and overdone. Um, but I don't remember seeing anything like this from Dicro of the 70s or even Dicro of today. So elegant. And I'm, you know, I, I, I'm saying that from my heart. I wouldn't, it really does look elegant uh, and, and, you know, worthy of, of, a statement piece, you know, and do, and do you think of, of different statement pieces to sort of motivate you to combine your colors or how does that work? Uh, well, I find that in, uh, you know, testing the, the materials that certain colors work better than others when I'm trying to, to put things together. Uh, and also certain colors bring people into the booth more often. Um, I find that, uh, Blue is my favorite color, and blue is what attracts people to the booth faster than any other color. Isn't that uh, interesting? Mm -hmm. Yes, and so, you know, something like that brings people in. Um, but also sometimes my signs, people will come in and go, I want that one, you know. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but there are certain times when blue doesn't give me the right result with the combination, you know, with the pattern that I might use with it. So. Uh, I do f sometimes follow, you know, form and function do have to work together sometimes. Uh, and then there are times when I make mistakes that turn out brilliantly. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> I've had a couple of mistakes that are like, oh my God, I love that because you know, goodness knows you have plenty of mistakes that are like, I'm never showing this to anyone ever. It, this didn't happen. <laughs> You know, we are in the in the realm of process. So when you come into your studio um, on a, when on a daily basis or whatever your discipline is, how, what are you thinking? Are you saying this is earring day? This is pendant day? This is, or is it is it more of the materials? What are you? What tell us something about how how your day goes in your studio or how you separate your different pieces? Yes, I do generally go in with at least one piece in mind, whether it's a, a pendant or, you know, 
I don't make sets a lot, um, but uh, sometimes I do. And um, I'll have definitely one goal in mind uh, when I'm putting things together. But as I'm getting the materials out and doing my cutting and layering, it generally will take me, I'm like, oh, look, I found this. I've been wanting to do something with this. So I'll start with um, the one piece that I, that I want to make and I'll, I'll be working on the, the, the cutting that I need to do to, to get it into the kiln. And then um, I usually like, you know, did you see the, the movie Up with that dog, Doug? It's like, look, squirrel. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, you get excited by something and I just, I go with the moment of it. Um, but I always sort of start with, you know, um, in my last batch, I, you know, I love, it's Christmas every time I open the kiln after doing a batch and seeing how things turned out. Um, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And um, so I will make notes to myself of, okay, this didn't turn out quite how I wanted it to be. So I'm going to try it, you know, either a little bit larger or smaller. Or it's just, or it's, it's, I've got too many square pieces. I want to mix it up. Um, or how would this look, you know, if with fuchsia instead of just pink, you know? So um, mm -hmm. each new batch inspires uh, where I want to go with the next one. And, and also what my clients buy and, you know, custom orders. Yeah, I was, I, you must have been reading my mind. So <laughs> custom orders are definitely an option with you. People may bring in something that they want the earrings to match or mm -hmm. something along that line. Yes. In fact, uh, all of my rings are custom uh, because I have to make the, you know, have to use the ring that's to the size. So every ring that I sell is custom. So you could just sort of like, say I want you know something similar to this and then I'll work with you on how how I can make it because it, it has to work within a certain size so um, you know I couldn't make this in a ring unless you want you know because this can't be made much a, a lot smaller yeah and I do custom bracelets and things like that and really anything can be custom including cufflinks whoa all right that's great so I noticed that you're heavily involved in a professional organization, um, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have the name of it on top of my head, the, your, if you would help me a little bit. Absolutely. It's an, uh, NCAGG, which is the National, um, now I'm going to fumble, <laughs> <laughs> National Capital Art Glass Guild, and I am the president. <laughs> there we go. Okay. It's embarrassing I mean, how do you see the the professional associations helping to spread the word in the community to support art we had this discussion in, in my previous interview and I don't care what medium it is it just seems to me that you get the professional support or personal support but have do you guys talk about you know how can we also get people interested in what we do and how we can support ourselves and the community. Yes, that's definitely part of our mission, you know, our mission is to uh, involve the community and get them, you know, uh, interested and, you know, understanding that we exist. Um, and, and, and our, our goal is to, you know, make uh, glass art a, a real craft and, and uh, make us all masters of you know, artisans of, of the craft. So um, there are like Glen Echo is a, is a um, place in off MacArthur Boulevard in, in DC. And uh, it has a, a studio that takes care of all kinds of art, including glass. And they have artists that work on premise um, as well as artists and makers in, in Rockville. And, and I'm sure, you know, a number of other places that I'm not mentioning right now. And we, we do, um, we just um, started face, you know, our Facebook page. We discovered that um, it exists and it had been for years and it hadn't been active. So we reactivated uh, the Facebook and you just get, you know, involvement. And of course that can, you know, have the, the ripple effect of social media, how that can be. Um, but you know, you're, it's, a, it's a lot of competition for people's attention span these days. So you, you, you do the best you can and you get the members you know, to, to help. You and know, that's and, why we have MPA Art Fest. <laughs> and definitely MPA Art Fest, <laughs> because you're yeah. meeting people and you know, get the word out. Yeah. Um, 
so are there any themes or processes that, that you've been thinking about jumping into in relation to your current art that you would share with me? Is there something you've been thinking about that... Uh, I'm sorry, I missed, the, I missed the last part of that question. Uh, what What would be a challenge for you? Have you been Have you been entertaining? It's like I find you very adventuresome. So, are there some processes or are there some materials that you think that you know maybe you're ready for that next that you would share with us? Oh well, as a matter of fact, I took a silversmithing class uh, in that ended the first week in March uh, before we knew anything about the, the lockdown. And uh, because I want, I want to elevate, I mean, and I, I want to elevate my art. Right. I want to, you know, get in the, the, the best shows I, that I can get into. And um, you know, what artist doesn't want to get better, faster, stronger all the time. Um, and I'd like to try framing some of my uh, pendants and things in, you know, silver, copper, um, Things like that. I, I've seen some artists uh, do it with the, and, and I, it just is a whole different, you know, level of elegance and uh, um, work, you know, craftsmanship. And so, uh, Glenn Echo also offers those those um, those classes, and that's one of the next things on my list to try. Is like, how you know, will it work for me? But you know, you just take a class and see how it goes. Level of elegance. Great phrase for you. I can just I can just see that emanating. So listen, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you kind of wish I had and you'd like to share with our MPA audience and beyond? Uh, well, um, I'm very proud of, to sh share that I was the featured artist in the June issue of Handmade Business magazine, which is the, the so that that was a uh, my, my first feature article and that was uh that was pretty exciting to to, to be in that um also with with covid i i don't think i felt the normal anxiety that uh many many other people did because i'm very blessed to have the means that you know we live within and um we can feed ourselves um so we we give back in those ways but um the healthcare workers i i just felt Staying home, I know, is, is helpful to them, but I had to give back. So I have a, a childhood friend who's a, um, a NICU nurse, and I donated earrings to the nursing staff uh, to just as a thank you for, for being there and doing something. And it just made me feel like, you know, more than just saying thank you, I let them <laughs> wear sparkly, pretty things, thank you. And then they, they took a picture well, you know, with who the, the nurses that chose which which of the earrings I donated, and they were they were thrilled, and and I was I think more thrilled. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer Moffat. It's been a pleasure to interview with you, and I wish you a great deal of success. Thank you so much. I'm I'm thrilled to be at MPA Arts Fest, and I'm looking forward to be this being the first of many years. Hello, Elise. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. Welcome to EPA Art Fest interviews. Thank you. You have such a diverse background, and there's so much you have to offer. I can't wait to, to just get started here. Um, can you share a little bit about the overview of the kinds of work that you offer? And then we'll zero in on one at a time. Sure. Um, my portfolio includes lots of things, as you just said. So my interest in art has always been in, I would say, the narrative um, and in human behavior. So no matter what I do, I love focusing on subjects of people, animals, objects, and giving them a feeling that there's a personality. Mm. In, and... Um, in the birds, one comment I get all the time is this um, reaction of, wow, they have such great personalities. Um, and that's an interesting thing for me to think about as I make them because I don't have this preconceived idea of what they should look like 
uh, I mean, as far as expression. And the expression just manifests by way of the materials I'm using and the compositions and how they end up coming together. So when I look at the, at the birds behind you, tell me something about um, their makeup and, and the processes you go through when you, when you go into your studio, when you're working on these birds. Well, as I describe on my website, this, this process of making birds is like being on a treasure hunt. Um, I really love object design. I, I really respect and admire other people who make things and especially functional things. Um, I'm interested in mechanical objects and tools and how things work. Um, I will find components that they're otherwise going to be discarded to then bring into my work. So you could say that I use an element of recycling in what I do, um, but I'm drawn to these objects that may be weathered or old or distressed because I feel like the age quality um, brings a lovely textural aspect to uh, what that object is all about. So it's fun for me to implement that into a bird sculpture. Um, behind me are 10 brand new birds. They originated uh, from a couple of things. Um, sometimes I use chopsticks for the legs of the birds. And I happened to come across these fantastic chopsticks that I just went nuts over. I mean, if someone saw me in the store, they would have thought I was really crazy. <laughs> but I ended up buying 10 pairs of these gorgeous chopsticks because I knew they would make great bird legs. And they had somewhat of a mid-century feel to them, almost like a tiki, like a tiki bar look. And uh, I had a book at home of mid-century fabric design, which I gave myself permission to cut up and use for these birds. And so uh, when I thought about bringing together the chopsticks, the mid-century fabric design, and then these lovely elongated black beaks that I could use, which are in fact hair clips. Um, that all made a lot of sense to me. And then I made a trip up to G Street Fabrics and I very happily went about picking out very beautiful select buttons that I wanted to then add to the design of these birds. So production for these 10 birds was a lot of fun. I had them all going at the same time. And when I finished, I looked at all of them. I went, wow, you did it. You know, there they are. <laughs> so it's interesting. If I, if I ask you, how often do you experiment? It sounds like you're always experimenting. Oh, God, yeah. I mean, I've made, I probably made over 300 of these. And I've sold most of them, I mean, all of them except my current inventory. And so, of course, I'm always looking for, how can I vary this theme? Um, birds became the right animal for me to work with because I tried, I tried other animals. I tried cats and dogs, fish. I did a few elephants. And they were all a lot of fun to do. But the birds were great because every time I could vary the beak, the wings, and the legs. Mm -hmm. I found so much different kind, so many different kinds of material to use in that way. Mm. So you've talked about special tools. So why don't you show us, you've got some others right uh, near you that are, you want to just uh, hold some of them up before we kind of move on to some other things? And um, this is a Ooh. bird that has for the beak, which is pointing straight up in the air, this is a pair of snips. Um, they're brand new, but I love them because of the color of the handle, which you can see a little bit of it here. It's kind of a deep gold. And then these beautiful uh, pieces of steel that make up the, you know, the end of the snips. The rest of the snips are embedded in the bird. And then down below, you can see for the uh, feed, I've put on these wheels. And so, <laughs> you know, I love that idea. I call this series the Zoom birds because, and not because of Zoom meetings. <laughs> the Zoom meetings happen after the fact, but um, the, they're all, there are four of them and they all have beaks that are aiming straight up. 
like they're going to take off, you know, especially with these uh, wheels, giving you the sense of motion. Um, so I've used wheels before. Here's another bird with, with antique wheels. So this bird, as you can see, has the wooden wheels and they're going, they're pointing in the left to the left, whereas the zoom bird had them facing you. So again, I can vary the way you see the wheels and what might be more interesting facing them one way or the other depends on the um, actual fabrication of that wheel. If you look at this beak, this is made out of um, not, not clips or hair clip, but uh, these are cut nails. And in construction, cut nails are used for uh, pounding a nail into mortar, into joints between bricks. Mm -hmm. And of course, if I put two of them together, they make a beautiful bird beak. And the wings on this bird, I didn't talk to you about the wings on that bird. The wings on the Zoom bird were made from antique, uh, an antique alphabet. And these birds are made out of an old map of New York City. And so I've used this old map probably, I've done maybe six birds like this. And they're called, like this one's called Green Bird Rolls into New York City. <laughs> and of course I have thought, well, wow, I should really keep exploring maps because you know, that, that's a great way to kind of create a theme of people who like to travel might love a bird like this, or if they've lived in a certain part of the world. Um, I've done them with Italy, with maps of Italy, and I'm keeping my eyes out for interesting maps of other places in the world. Um, should I keep going and show yes, you? Keep going. Yeah, show us one more of these other birds and then let, let's talk about some of your other uh, art. Okay, here's a bird that doesn't have wings it has arms okay and the arms are made out of wire they're painted um and i twisted them to look like this and the legs these legs are made out of dowel um this beak is another hair clip but the different thing about this bird besides the arms not being um you know no wings just arms makes it more anthropomorphic um, I've also treated the, the drawing on the bird a little bit more elaborately. Yeah. Um, so that's another thing you may not realize. The bird bodies are made out of a cellulose material that acts like clay and it hardens. It, it's an air dry substance. Once they're dry, I sand them and I draw on them. So Did all they the alone done with ink. Do they stand alone or do they, are they hung on the wall? can't stand by themselves. They're meant to be hung on a wall. If I turn it around, okay. you can see it's flat. And there's always a D-ring and I sign the birds and, you know, they're ready to go. And they're meant for a flat substrate. They're meant for a wall, really. That's the way they look the best on a wall. Um, once in a while, I make my own wings and this bird has hand-painted wings. So I wanted to show you that. This has a really beautiful um, iridescent hair clip. Hair clips are very cool. You know, they come in so many varieties and I love working with them and they really imitate a beak. So, and then on the legs on this bird, these are also cut nails, but they're turned so that the point is going inside the bird. All right? Wow. So that just, little bird. Just gorgeous. So tell us about some of your other interests within your art. Sure. Well, the technique that you see on these birds of using ink is a, an illustration technique known as hatching. And I, as a child, I loved books and I love book illustration. It probably was one of the very first art forms that got me interested in making visual art. And I first started making these small mixed media sculptures, um, I wasn't drawing on them at all. And then I got the idea to try to do that. And it was successful. I got very excited about that because they started to look like three dimensional illustrations to me. And so um, that's been the way I've gone, you know, with this kind of work, I started making them, I would say in the, in the, in the 1990s, probably 
1998, maybe around that year. Um, and so there, that influence of book illustration, but also, again, the singular character, mm -hmm. which I enjoy um, when I paint. I've done a lot of paintings that feature just one uh, character that um, in, involves a lot of patterning. So I should also include pattern as a huge influence in my life coming from textiles where I learned how to sew at a very early age on a sewing machine and I love fabric. And I, I used to make a lot of my own clothes and make clothes for my kids when they were little. So I think uh, fiber plays a big role. Wow. Wow. I noticed on your website, you've, you have a very clever, clever idea, and that is you take a picture frame and you suggest to people uh, their own, putting together their own bird frame. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Somebody actually, uh, someone who bought one of the birds had, had the idea and sent me a photo and said, look what I did with the bird I bought. I had an old frame and I just put it on the wall around the bird and I went, wow. Perfect. That's genius. You know, you, it's, it's got to be the right frame, though, because you need enough space and you're not using a mat. You're not using glass. You're just using that old frame. And so, yeah, I've done that. Um, I've had pop up shows where I've had a lot of frames available for people. If they buy the bird, I just gave them the frame. Um, I've never actually ordered a frame for a bird, but I think that could be a really beautiful way to go, too, because frames can be amazing and it can really enhance you know what the bird's all about with texture and color mm. yeah you've certainly given me some ideas about coming over and uh, picking up some birds i'll bring the frame with me <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, is there very... anything that we haven't that i have you haven't talked about that you want to make sure our um mpa art fest watchers know about you that we really want to leave us with? What, what people should know is that I'm very dedicated to what I do. I love what I do. That every single thing I make, I put 200% of myself into it. Um, it doesn't matter how long it takes. I will just do it right. And I'm like that with these birds and I'm like that with all my paintings and drawings. And you know, I'm glad I, I was taught in an early age how to appreciate quality. Um, and I love anything that I come across that emulates that same sense of, you know, care. And I think as human beings, we have that capacity and we should take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. I think we have a much happier world if we all felt that quality was important and that things last and endure, you know. And send that out to the community, right? Yes. Yeah. That's right. Well, Elise, I have really enjoyed talking with you. I know that <clears throat> this is going to be a great time for you uh, being up on the website for people to hear about you and come visit you in Bethesda, correct? Really looking forward to um, the additional. Well, we can also buy online, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I hope people can get a real sense of what I'm offering online, but of course I can make room for any kind of visit. I'd be happy to do that with anyone who's interested. They let me know which birds they'd like me to show them. I'm there. Okay. And you know, I have people who have collected these for years and they, they keep coming back for more. I think there's a, a nice little addictive quality to collecting them. They're not terribly expensive and you know, it's a nice gift. Certainly I've had, sold a lot as gifts. I've sold them as wedding gifts, you know? Um, so yeah, I think it's Just a good- warming gifts, I can see one right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Thank you again. You're very welcome. And now that really concludes the three interviews uh, for today for the MPA Art Fest uh, art interviews. And it's been a pleasure exploring the worlds of each of these artists and I, encourage all of you to please go on the MPA website and seek out the other artists and their great work and their energy.